<clears throat> yeah. All right, so picture this. You've been assigned to work on a new project. You have to support an app that uses uh, Apache, PHP, MySQL, and RabbitMQ in between, right? Pretty standard stuff. Uh, the application is Brownfield, and this has all been deployed by hand in the past, but now you are responsible for it. There's another component here, right, which is you also need to use not only those standard software components, but you have to manage your own application content, you have to manage your own app configs, and you can do that, right, because you love config management and automation. This is great. So what do we choose to start automating all of that? In my example today, I'm gonna use Chef because I'm about to talk some trash and I really don't wanna step on any toes. Uh, but this problem applies to everyone. This is a persistent problem across the board. But because I need an example, uh, I'm gonna use Chef for, uh, for this bit of the talk. So we decide to go with Chef, right? And this is gonna be great, I love Nathan Harvey. Chef is awesome, I'm stoked, right? This is gonna be amazing. So we decide to get started. And I look at my stack and I start decomposing it into bits, right? I'm gonna start with RabbitMQ. That's a pretty standard piece of software, right? So there's gotta be a cookbook for this already. So I go to the Chef supermarket, right? And I start plugging in a couple of search terms and I find my RabbitMQ cookbook, there it is. Bam, right, I told you this was gonna be awesome. So I should go grab this, cook, this cookbook and use it to start managing my stack, right? And if I download this cookbook from the internet, I should read the source code, that's good practice. So I start poking around, looking at this recipe to try to figure out what it does, and then I see this. And like, what, I, I can't even, what is happening here? Like there, there are just so many little exceptions in here that are being managed, can you see that on the screen? It's kind of dark. If you could see that, you'd see that there are a number of exceptions here. There are even some notes on weird things that Zipper does in some instances when you're using Suzy. And really what we're managing here are a lot of different platform idiosyncrasies. I'm so glad I don't have to maintain that cookbook. But all right, whatever. I may not necessarily get everything that's happening, but this is a public cookbook, right? So I'm sure it's gotta work. Like we're gonna grab it and use it anyway. And so it goes with the rest of my stack, right? Like these are common software components, code exists to manage these. And some of these components are consistent across platforms, and so the code for those is really easy to understand. But if these software components differ from platform to platform, the code is also really difficult to grok, like what is happening there, right? There's a lot of complexity that's being managed. So whatever, right, some of these cookbooks may be a little easier to grok than others, uh, but you know, this is the way it, it goes. I may understand some of them, I may not, but I'm just gonna go ahead and use them. Before you judge me, remember, there's probably similar blood on your hands. You've been in this situation before. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grab it and use it. But there's one part here that doesn't have a cookbook, right? That's the part where I'm managing my own application code. That is unique to my organization so I need to write some code for that myself, right? And so I decide, okay, let's start writing some code. We're gonna do that. My application has a few different places that it needs to run. I know it needs to run in the cloud, so I'm gonna start there. I write some tests, right? I write a little bit of code. I model some patterns, and then I try to deploy it, and yay, it works, right? Okay, so far so good. Let's move on to the next one. I have a couple of data centers where this needs to run, right? This is a brownfield application that's been going for a while. And so I look at data center A, and what's it gonna take to run in data center A? And in data center A, we have an earlier version of this app that was run by contract, or sorry, that was written by contractors. Uh, these contractors decided to use some hipster OS that was flavor of the day at that particular point when they deployed it. And the code that I wrote to deploy my app doesn't work on hipster OS, so crap. Right, I don't really know hipster OS, so what do I do? I start digging around to figure out like what's going on, right? I look at some docs, I do a little bit of reading, do some troubleshooting. I'm pretty irritated, but you know, whatever. This is the way it goes, it happens. And a few hours later, I'm kind of frustrated. It's like, it's not really working, but you know, fine. I go through a little bit of pain, I get it into a good place, and yay, right, all right. I was a little bit frustrated, but my code finally got to a place where I could deploy. Let's move on to data center B. 
data center B is the data center that time forgot. Like this was set up even before we had hipster contractors with hipster OS, right? And this is uh, an implementation that's a little obscure, right? Maybe not super well understood by me or anybody that's working with me, but okay, whatever, same drill. We've been through this before. Dig in and start to figure out like, why is this broken? It's pretty frustrating, but you know, maybe I spent a couple of hours on Stack Overflow. I started trying to figure out if anybody else has seen this problem. And then finally I get a lead, right? I discover after a while that my application uses Zlib. And this works everywhere else, but on this esoteric OS that I'm managing, esoteric OS has a version of Zlib that is not gonna work with my application. Okay, well I could try to update that, right? So I try to update the distro package, but Esoteric OS hasn't released an update to Zlib in over a year, right? Well, crap, that's not gonna work for me. That's not getting me anywhere. So I need a new package, right? It's something that the OS doesn't ship. So maybe I find one, right? Maybe I build one myself and I try to deploy it, right? I get to a modern version of Zlib. I write some code to install it. I wire my app to it. I write some tests. I try to deploy it. And then suddenly all my tests start failing. Right? So I start digging into this node, figuring out like, why is this broken? What the hell is going on, right? And I start seeing things like this. I see a bunch of failed dependencies. I'm getting open SSL errors? What the hell? I didn't even touch open SSL, right? Like, why is this happening? What the hell broke, right? Why am I dealing with this nonsense and table flip, right? <laughs> Clearly you feel my pain. Some of you have been here before. So you know why you find yourself in this position? It's because Operating systems are assholes. <laughs> Thank you. So I should introduce myself. Hi, everyone. I'm George Miranda. Um, I think operating systems are assholes. Uh, I also work for Chef, right? So earlier when I used Chef as an example, uh, I, you know, I knew I was doing some complaining, so I didn't want to point fingers and operate in my own world instead. But again, this is a problem that exists across the board. Uh, I made my career as a sysadmin for over 15 years. Uh, I've been very involved with configuration management and automation. Uh, I used TF Engine. I did a bunch of work with Puppet. Uh, I wrote my own frameworks um, before joining Chef. Uh, I've been coming to Config Management Camp um, since the beginning. Uh, I'm also mostly a Unix guy. Uh, I've worked with Windows a little bit. Uh, my first Unix was AIX. Uh, followed by Slackware. Anybody use Slackware? Anybody remember Slackware? Woo! Slackware! Uh, then I started working with Suzy, went over to Solaris, right? Spent some time with the BSDs, both open and free. Uh, I did my time with HPUX, those were the dark years. Um, Debian, Ubuntu, RHEL, CentOS, right? All of this stuff before coming to Chef. And the one thing that was consistent throughout was dealing with operating system idiosyncrasies. Everybody has a different convention, they have a different way of doing things, and switching from one to the other means you have to learn those things all over again, right? That's just how it goes. That's what we accept as normal, right? That's just the way that the world works. This has been a really interesting year, and if this year has taught me anything, it's that at some point things get out of hand, and you have to speak out against things that are not normal, right? That's the only way to stop the insanity. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, how did we even get here, right? Why are we putting up with this? So again, right, operating systems are assholes. We have a very abusive relationship with them. Seemingly small differences in convention really just create a boatload of pain. And we put up with it because we think we need to. That's just the way it's always been, right? But I think the time to end the abuse is now. So what I really want to do in this talk is challenge our assumptions. Uh, let's look at operating systems and ask the question, do we really need them, right? If we do need them, to what level do we need them? If we don't, well, how far does that really go, right? Let's start by looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly, what works, what doesn't, and how we can improve the state that we're in today. So the only way to move forward is to understand how you got here. So we're gonna start with a short little introduction, the history of operating systems to set a little bit of context. In the 1940s, the earliest digital computers had no operating system, right? These were single 
purpose machines and they were basically specialized calculators, right? They only had one real function and it was really difficult to change. You could change it by using one of these plug boards, right? And you set some jumper wires, right? Or you like flip rows of mechanical switches. Um, but it was very labor intensive and it was pretty impractical to change the way that your machine operated. So generally speaking, what we had back then was single machines with a single purpose. But those got better over time, right? And in the 1950s, what we had was a single machine that could be multi-purpose. They could only execute one program at a time, right? They were still single task. But the way it worked, right, is that in institutions that were lucky enough to have a computer, you could book a little bit of time. And whenever your appointment arrived, you would show up wherever the computer was. You would bring this stack of punch cards or maybe even punch tape that had your program and any of the associated data with it. And somebody would load it all into the computer. right? And then your program would run for a given period of time. And that given, that given period of time was either until the, pro the program completed or it crashed. Uh, interesting side note, I discovered when I was researching this that if your program did crash and you still had some appointment time, it was a common practice to bring a little bit of tape with you so that you could cover up the holes that were causing programs uh, to crash or that were problematic. And so developers would patch their code and that's where the term patching comes from. Anyway, little sidebar. But, right, machines continue to get better. And in the 60s, what we see is that machines start to come with libraries of code that cover common functions. And this was a huge step forward because now you had a smaller stack of cards to bring with you, kind of like the cards on that shelf, if you can see that, right? This huge stack of things that you had to do every single time you were going to interact with this machine, right? Instead, we could have basic libraries that covered you know, I.O. operations, how you take machine code and translate that to something that's human readable, right? Common boilerplate functions, right? These were things that we could just package with the machine. And that was the genesis of modern day operating systems, right? The fact that we could do something to abstract some of those basic functions. In that same decade, IBM had a revolutionary idea. They thought, well, what if we take these libraries and we put them on our entire line of machines, right? So now you write a program for IBM machines and you can run it on any one of our mainframes, right? It goes across the entire line. And at this point, right, machines were still pretty much single task. Programs were still manually loaded one at a time. Uh, and then later that same decade, uh, IBM came out with OS 360 and OS 360 concepts like we could keep track of what resources are in use at any given time. So if a program terminates, we could go ahead and recapture those and reuse them somewhere else. Uh, we could allocate space in memory for not just our program, but for data. And we could even page out to an associated file system. And hell, let's create even a file system, right? With file locks and make it safe to make updates to those things. And so by the 70s, Unix is a real thing, and we get simultaneous batch processing, we get timeshare use, and what we end up with now is finally we have single machines that are multi-purpose and multitasking. And that's kind of the, the start of the common computing era, right? And we discover that with operating systems, we get all of these great benefits, right? No longer do we have to manage all of these things by hand, right? We don't have to worry on those low-level details, I'm like, wow, this is great. Now that we don't have to focus on all those low-level details, we can start focusing on things that we find more interesting. And it's around this time that you start seeing real-time chat programs, right? And games with graphical interfaces, because now we have a lot more leeway to just focus on the things that, you know, are the fun part. But there's one more thing that we get from operating systems. And this is where it starts to go wrong. Operating systems also give us a user interface. And in the 70s and the 80s, this made a ton of sense, right? Because we now have, finally, multi-purpose, multitasking machines, and anything is possible, right? So operating systems really pick up speed around this time. You know, we get into the common, or to the, I guess, the modern computing era. Um, and operating systems start 
helping with all sorts of additional functions. Now that part is still good, um, but here's where it forks off into what got us here today. And it's right around this time that organizations start noticing this, and I'm talking organizations like schools, private companies, um, government organizations, and they all start choosing BSD instead of the Unix that AT&T was shipping because it has a much richer user interface. And that was the right thing at the time, right? But user interfaces are made for people. They're not really made for machines. And people, it turns out, really want to do some funky things once they get a good user interface. They do things like create software packages and call them different names in different places with different conventions, depending on where you're running them. They make a network of dynamically linked, maybe sort of mostly independent packages. Uh, they start making operating systems as hobbies, like what the hell is even going on there, right? We get this, this huge explosion of different flavors. And they start getting into holy wars over which tools are better, right? Or whether we need static or dynamic libraries. And each faction of this holy war believes that their side is entirely right, right? And so they create even more distributions with more customization options, with their own conventions. Right? Because screw that group over there, right? They have no idea what they're doing. We're going to do it my way. And what we end up with, right, are weird coding disasters that you can't see on that slide um, to deal with things like this. So operating systems are assholes because they're a, dis they're a descendant of a legacy of disagreement, right? A legacy of self-righteousness and non-cooperation and working in silos, right? And all the things that we know are ultimately destructive because, hey, we believe in DevOps. So operating systems are assholes because we've been assholes, right? But it doesn't have to stay that way. And I'm pitching this idea now because I think we're finally at a place where maybe the UI doesn't matter so much, right? Like a kind of a number of things have happened that have led us here in a really interesting way. So UIs are for humans, right? They're not really for machines. So that means that you know, UIs really matter here, right? On your phone when you have a wealth of things you might possibly be doing, right? UIs matter here, they matter on tablets, they matter on your workstations, right? They also matter here. But do UIs really matter here? Right, that's the question. We're in the era of config management, right? You're at config management camp. We are in the era of automation. We are in the era of distributed microservices, right? We're in the era of never logging into a machine directly. So do UIs still really matter here? Right? And how did we get here? Why is now the time? Because we've gone from having a single machine with a single purpose to having one machine that is multi-purpose, to having one machine that's multi-purpose and multitasking, to having multi-purpose, multitasking uh, capabilities across several types of machines, right, with anything being possible. And then we get into an era where we have several smaller machines right, under one physical machine, and all of those smaller machines also have multi-purpose, multitasking capabilities. And then we come all the way back around to having distributed micro-machines everywhere. And those micro-machines that we use, if you're doing microservices the right way, right, they go back to being single machines with a single purpose, right? We've basically gone full circle in a way. We no longer have to support every possible use case. We have to support one use case. What do our applications need in order to run? So why are we still ensuring that we could have every possible config inside of those micro-machines? <coughs> Operating systems are assholes, and it's time to fix that. So at the start of this talk, I said that we would look at the good, the bad, and the ugly, and figure out where to go from here. So let's do that. Let's start with that. So the good, right? Uh, we covered the idea that an operating system creates an abstraction layer, 
right? So that we stop focusing on low level details. Uh, we put that abstraction layer on top of a mechanical machine and make sure that it covers common functions so we don't even have to think about how we talk to this particular machine. And if we put enough boilerplate things on top, then we open ourselves up to just, you know, focusing on those things that we actually care about, right? Writing applications and programs and things that are a little bit higher level, right? Rather than managing all of that low level stuff and recreating the world every single time. So, right, so the good parts. We need a good machine abstraction layer. And then our applications are written for specific operating systems, sometimes even for specific hardware. Right? And when you port an application between operating systems, it gets a little tricky, right? because sometimes the functionality that your application needs might be implemented a little bit differently on this particular operating system, which means things like you know, the names of functions are different, uh, the meanings of arguments, the outputs that you're going to get, right? They all have to be managed. You have to be updated. You have to maintain that over time. And so, again, what we end up getting with operating systems is we get a little bit of an ability to port between machines, but we don't really get a way to port between applications, right? We still need to manage that. So it falls a little bit short, right? Um, we still need some application portability, right? And so, actually, I want to back up for a minute here uh, and point something out. So now, we're also in an era where uh, many operating systems can run on the same type of hardware, for example, Intel. So Windows folks, if there are Windows folks in the room, any Windows folks? Wow, no Windows folks. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> So, all right, so even if you were a Windows person, right, like, I have not meant to exclude them from the conversation. It's just that they came to the operating system table so late in the historical narrative that I'm just kind of getting to that part now. But this applies to Windows as well, right? And the reason that it applies to Windows is because at the end of the day, what we care about is uh, we care about our applications, right? We care about applications actually running places. But we've always had to contend with the initial question of, well, what operating system is on the machine that I have access to in order to start writing this, right? And we get locked into that operating system. And really, all we've wanted all along is the ability to just make our applications portable. So that's a little bit of where we, we fall short with some of the good. But let's go ahead and look at the bad, right? What are operating systems not giving us? Like, this is the part that I started with, right? That little rant about how operating systems are assholes. But why are they assholes? Um, there are tons of idiosyncrasies, right? And oftentimes, the same application will behave in bizarre and unpredictable ways when you change that underlying abstraction layer. So for the sake of argument, although it felt like most of you supported me, but for the sake of argument, let's say that you are not completely on board with this idea. If you are not completely on board with the idea that managing those idiosyncrasies is really a pain that we need to solve, well, you have Stockholm Syndrome. You have sympathized with your captors. It's cool, I get it, it happens. Um, but trust me, these things are terrible. Let's talk about something a little more specifically relevant to this crowd. Um, we have ambiguous ways that we carry out config management. So let's think about how we do config management today, right? You have two approaches when you start with config management. You could either only config manage the things you care about managing, or you could config manage everything on your systems. And when I say you config manage everything on your systems, I don't just mean, you know, running services and installed software packages, user permissions, you know, network settings. I mean everything, right? If you are going to manage everything on your system, we're talking about managing the content of device files, right? Making sure that your, the content of your drivers is correct, managing everything in proc, right? Managing everything that happens when you do an apt-get update. What the hell even happens when you do an apt-get update? Does anybody know what all the moving pieces are, or what happens? There's like one dude in the back of the room that's all like, yeah, I understand what happens. But for the rest of you, right, like my point here is sometimes it's impractical, right? Like you have to have so much low level knowledge that most of us don't have the time or the bandwidth to manage all of that explicitly. So what's the compromise that we make, right? We just manage the bits of configuration that we really care about. And when we do that, what we end up with is 
a little bit of ambiguity, right? We have a trust relationship with our operating system. Like, we just trust that, hey, this OS, you know, is configured in some ways and it knows what it's doing and so it's cool, we're just gonna trust that it's there. But there's a lot of ambiguity in that trust relationship, right? That ambiguity leads to vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities lead to suffering, and there's, there's kind of a lack of visibility and auditability that's missing. So think about it this way, right? When Shellshock came about, did you even know which version of Bash you were running on your systems, right? Or which version of Shell was there? Like most people I know weren't config managing Bash at that time, right? Or like weren't until then. And so you had to really dig through and figure out like, well, here's this bit of the operating system that I just took for granted and now I actually really have to care about it. And so we have these giant blind spots that exist. Maybe that example doesn't apply to you because you've been managing your shell versions all along, but if we dig long enough, I'm sure I'm gonna find something, right? Those ambiguities exist. We have blind spots. And then there's the, uh, I guess, the issue of support. So does anybody here work on a team that does uh, like third level support and you have somebody managing the front lines? Do you pass off to support folks like that, right? A few people. So if that's you, right, you probably have run books that describe what to do when. And they probably look a little something like this, right? This matrix of which apps work where, how you're supposed to work with it and here as opposed to there, maybe some things that haven't been fully covered yet, right? And if you don't, and I've been in both positions where I've had run books and where I don't because I've created an abstraction layer so that anybody interacting with it just deals with some automation that covers all of that up and makes it easy and makes it the same process everywhere. But if you've done that, right, and you create that level of abstraction, then your test matrix looks like that, right? And you're just testing all of these permutations and you end up managing exception sprawl. So those seemingly benign differences between operating systems have a way of unfolding into operational and support nightmares. And what we end up doing is we take those blind spots that we know that we have and we bake in all of those assumptions that come with them, right? We keep increasing ambiguity every single time we go to a different platform or extend the bounds of that trust relationship, right? What we really need is auditability and we need visibility into, the, into what it is that we're managing, right? We need to have some assurance that what our applications are doing, everything in the stack is actually doing the right thing, right? We need to remove some of the ambiguity. Now let's talk about my personal favorite, which is the ugly, right? So we know we have these blind spots, right? We know that this ambiguity exists. We know that it's a huge potential for risk. And that risk is not theoretical, right? That risk has bitten just about everybody in this room, I am sure, right? So I know what we should do. We should take that ambiguity and that risk, all of those blind spots that we have, and we should multiply it by a couple of orders of magnitude and then distribute that risk everywhere, <laughs> right? This is what we do with containers. <laughs> so containers are actually a pretty wonderful thing, right? They create portability, they create an abstraction layer on top of any operating system that you're using that really starts to deliver on that promise of application portability. So containers have been around forever, right? But it was Docker that pioneered the idea of giving you an application artifact that you could download and just have that thing running anywhere, right? I do not care about your underlying operating system. And that's great, right? That actually starts moving us forward. Um, we don't care about the underlying operating system. It's abstracted. We don't need to worry about those low level details. We go straight to running an app and that is awesome. But then, what did we do, right? As soon as we were given this great, amazing ability to run applications anywhere and remove some of that complexity, we went ahead and just started shoving operating systems right back into our containers, right? With all of their interdependencies, with all of their ambiguities. And so earlier, right, I was picking on Zlib. Let's say that we leave this conference tomorrow and we see a vulnerability notification that tells us, you know, versions of Zlib below X are vulnerable to this exploit. Do we even know which of our containers are vulnerable to this exploit? Do we know which versions of Zlib are running, right? We just took the operating system's word for it. 
Do we have a good way of finding out? Right? And, and if we find out, do we have a process for quickly patching our immutable process, right? our immutable artifact and redeploying it? The sad reality is that most organizations wouldn't even know if they were affected. And so a lot of them probably wouldn't even patch it, right? Because there's no way to tell. So why are we dealing with this level of complexity for single micro machines that have a single purpose, right? Operating systems are assholes. They get in our way more than we realize and they cause a lot of pain at the worst possible times when that trust relationship goes wrong. We need to break that abuse cycle. So what have we learned, right? We've learned a couple of things from our history of computing and from how we've approached config management and automation. Uh, operating systems are really good at a few things. Uh, they manage physical system settings. They provide abstractions that help us fo uh, focus on those higher level goals, right? Starting to write applications that matter. And so yes, right, operating systems have a place, but to a degree, right? User interfaces are for humans, and I think that is the part where things start to go wrong and the part where we expose and include a lot more things that lead to that level of ambiguity. When we don't know what we want, and anything is possible on a device, and we need all of those options, having a UI and having a full-blown operating system is great. But when we already know what we need to do, and we've baked all of that functionality into an artifact that's not going to change, that is a known quantity, right? all of those additional options only serve to create ambiguity and make it harder to support them. So our production applications, they have a single purpose. right? We know what those functions are. We know what software we need to actually support those. And they are starting to live. And if they don't live there yet for you, they will live on single purpose, single micro machines. So let's strip out that additional UI. Right? It's not really serving the need of our production applications. So containers are a great packaging promise. They give us another layer of abstraction so that underlying uh, operating systems idiosyncrasies no longer matter, right? so that we don't have to think about those. But then we go ahead and create a build artifact where we, we, where, uh, you know, we reintroduce them. What we really need are stripped down artifacts that have only what our applications need in order to run, right? So what I'm advocating is that we do the exact opposite of what it is that we're doing in config management today, right? In config management today, we're just managing those bits that we care about and just kind of assuming that a trust relationship with whatever's running them is there. I think that's the wrong thing to do. I think the right thing to do is actually, probably because I'm a sysadmin and a control freak, is know everything that is running, right? All the way down and manage that and be super explicit about it. But the only way to do that, right, the only way to see it all and understand what all of it does is if we strip away all that additional cruft, right? Otherwise, it's just not feasible. So we need to remove the ambiguity, right? We need to strip down those packages to only what our applications need so that we can have that explicit control, that explicit understanding, and make it easier to manage these things. So let's talk about a new way, right? If we could do this over again, and we can, we can always change the way that we, that we operate, how would we do it differently? So these are basically the guiding principles that I think get us there, right? It's having an abstraction layer that, you know, abstracts the machine that we are working on, all the positives of what operating systems give us. But then we need to strip out all of that additional user space, right? That UI is not doing us any good when we are managing production applications. Then we need an application runtime layer, right? And this is sort of what we're getting from containers today. We need that additional abstraction so that when we go between operating systems, our applications still work the same way, right? That's where we're taking care of all those operating system idiosyncrasies and interacting with them in a consistent way. And then lastly, right, 
that application artifact that we run on top of that additional abstraction layer, that needs to be as minimal as it can get, which basically means having almost no operating system in there. Right? We already have it further down the stack. So that's great. You know, fine, George, it's cool, but like, what does that mean to me today, right? How can I start getting there with the tools that we have now? And so the more time I focus on this space and this problem, the more I'm starting to see that no one really has it entirely right, but there are a lot of pieces out there that are pretty close that we can start piecing together to make a world that looks like this. So uh, operating systems. Uh, I think CoreOS has a lot of it right. Um, so, uh, sorry, CoreOS, right, now Container Linux. Does anybody use Container Linux? I saw a couple of hands on day one. All right, so a couple folks. But uh, operating, or sorry, uh, uh, Container Linux, right, is basically a way, it's a really stripped down operating system that focuses on just giving you enough tools to run containers and manage them, share config between them, and do a little bit of troubleshooting. If you start looking at CoreOS though, one of the things that you might notice is that it has a lot of assumptions baked in. Um, there are some hooks to do uh, automation, uh, but it also sort of caters to the idea that somebody's gonna log into this box and start poking around to figure out what's really, what's really going on, right? So I think CoreOS is a good part of the way there, but a deeper focus on configuration management uh, would definitely work. I think I've seen a couple of early experiments going in that direction, but they still have some pretty rough edges. <coughs> Container runtimes, right? So whether you're using Docker or Rocket or Mesos, right, take your pick, they all work pretty well. But we still need that abstraction layer on top of our operating systems to make our applications actually portable and able to run anywhere. If you, if you start going down the path of containers, right, you need a container management platform, whether it's Kubernetes or Swarm or Mesosphere, and that's a whole nother talk, not for today. Um, but the key is, right, you start capitalizing on the promise of application portability, right? And I believe you should do that for all applications, not just containers and microservices, right? There's no reason you can't do that even for legacy applications. And for that more universal approach, I'd say look to the Habitat project, right? Full disclosure, I work for Chef, and so I've gotten to spend a lot of time with Habitat, um, but this is a, a good place where I see that particular project fitting. Uh, and then, of course, right, if we've gotten to the place where we've removed that ambiguity and all of those idiosyncrasies, don't turn around and put them right back in, right? And that's how most containers are built today, right? The content of those actual containers seems to be the forgotten part of the artifact. And so if you start going down this route and you start building containers, one, you should always focus on building slim containers, but even that brings a whole lot of operating system with it. But the idea is you should be getting to a place where you minimize that trust relationship with an ambiguous operating system you may not fully understand. And the key here, right, is removing ambiguity, having some audibility mechanisms, and making it possible for us to be explicit about the entire stack all the way down and everything that we manage. Uh, I think Habitat is pretty good with that as well. Uh, if you wanna see how that works, we're running out of time here, or I'm running a little bit long, so there's a, there's a Habitat hack session tomorrow. Um, you can ask us some questions there, see how it comes together. Um, but even on its own, Habitat isn't a full solution either, but I think it does cover that use case pretty well. So to recap, right, I believe that the time to re-examine the role of operating systems is now, right? Because we've gone full circle from single machines that were single purpose to multi-purpose, multitasking machines to coming all the way back around, right? To single purpose, single micro machines. So why is an operating system still tagging along for the ride, right? We need to break that operating system abuse cycle. And the way that we do that is with patterns like this. And Finally, right, we should all learn from each other. So obviously, right, this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. The real lessons come in from time and experience and use and we flesh out a lot of details. So what I hope is that next year at Config Management Camp, if we start, if enough of us start going down this path, we can maybe even have a separate track on no OS configuration management. 
But my point here is, it doesn't really have to be this way anymore. Enough technology has come along to enable this shift. So let's start thinking about it, right? Let's start using it. Let's learn how to make it better, right? And mitigate the damage that operating systems are doing to us. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Uh, I ran a little bit long, but if you guys have questions, I'll be hanging around.